Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Shared Services Link and sponsored by Uruguay 21. Today, we'll be looking at the seven key factors for choosing the location of your shared services, and we'll be looking specifically at Sabra's story. My name is Sarah Fain, and I am the head of research at Shared Services Link, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Lisa Schwab, who's the Vice President at Sabra's Shared Services Center in Uruguay, as well as Fiorella Bafundo, who's Business Services Specialist at Uruguay 21. You, of course, have a very important role to play in today's webinar, and that is to make sure you really get the most out of this hour. Uh, for whatever reason you're tuning in today, please use this opportunity to ask us questions, um, and the more you can ask us, the more you can get from this webinar. Uh, so you can submit your questions to us using the question functionality, which is generally in the right-hand side of your screen on GoToWebinar, and we'll be taking questions in the last 10 minutes. The slides for the webinar will also be available uh, on our new site, www.sharespace.digital. Um, all you need to do is uh, you'll be sent a link to access the slides. Um, if you're not registered, simply create a free login and you'll see the slides available uh, along with a raft of other content on uh, shared services best practice. Now let's look at the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to open up with a little bit of context about why uh, we're doing this webinar. And then I'll explain the seven key factors we find crucial for people making a shortlist and choosing the location for their shared services center or when they're looking to relocate. I'll then hand over to Lisa, uh, who will give a really good insight onto Sabra's experience in choosing a location and how it's worked for them. Uh, then Fiorella will join uh, and give some insight into uh, Uruguay and how they support other shared services organizations uh, and businesses in the region. Again, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end of the session. So touching on context for today, um, we find a lot of shared services organizations face something like a, a five-year itch. Uh, so once they've established and chosen their location, every five years or so, they're having to reassess, okay, is this working for me? How is my uh, business growing? Where is our future? And they often look to reassess their location. So not only for new shared services centers, but for existing shared services center who need to look at their footprint and where they're growing, Location is an extremely important factor, and they often need a mixture of high quality and specialized talent. In this webinar, uh, we're delighted to have Sabra, who will uh, share their journey on choosing a location. And I think what really stands out to this story um, is that how they chose a location, um, mainly also on, on the culture, not only on cost, but on developing one that will really support the business's vision and goals. So. Before we dive into the seven factors, uh, we just want to get a sense of um, who's on the webinar with us today and understand if you're actually looking uh, to open or relocate a shared services center. Uh, so I believe you can take more than one here. Uh, so please let us know if you are looking. Are you looking in EMEA or Asia? Uh, are you looking in North America? Are you looking in Latin America? Um, are you looking, uh, but maybe you're not sure where, or perhaps not at the moment? Uh, so again, uh, we do like to get uh, high engagement on this. We have a little bit more than half. Uh, so again, if you could please tick the option uh, that best matches your situation, I'll be closing the polls in three, two, one. Uh, let's take a quick look at the results. Um, so it looks like uh, some of you are maybe not quite at the moment. Uh, but hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about um, Sabre's journey today. Uh, about 20% of you are, are undecided, and 20% uh, of you are looking in EMEA or Asia. Uh, so hopefully uh, this will open your eyes to maybe where might be a good fit for you to move to in the future. So um, if you're looking to make a shortlist, uh, we at Shared Services Link have seven factors that we think uh, we often see on company shortlist and that we think are really important to include. The first one is people and the labor market uh, in many shared services organizations. Uh, you know, people uh, can be really your most valuable asset. 
So it's important to understand if you're looking to a new region, what is the talent pool like? Uh, and how well will you be able to fill the vacancies that you'll have? Um, some important factors to look at are language uh, and degrees of education. Uh, so understanding what languages are widely spoken uh, and what kind of education levels are common for, for graduates if you're looking for, or more um, advanced uh, employees and really understanding what mix you're going to have. And uh, one thing that I know Lisa is going to touch on again is understanding different countries' cultures and how that might impact uh, the employees that you bring on in the new organization. The second important factor uh, we find is access. Now a shared services organization needs to be constantly communicating with the business and often the business needs to visit the shared services center. Uh, so understanding who needs to access your shared services center and how easy for it is it for them to do so will have an impact on how well you can set up meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, as does time zone. Um, understanding uh, who you'll be interacting with the most and whether the location supports the communication in the right time zone. Also, looking at flights from maybe your head office or different offices, understanding what kind of access the Shared Services Center will have for the key parts of the business that we will need to communicate with it. Factor number three we find is strategic presence. So this now means looking at not only where you currently are in your business, where is, is your revenue coming from, where is it strategically important for you to be, but also looking at the future. Where do you see the future of your business coming from? Are there certain regions that you find will be increasingly important? Uh, to your revenue and, and profits going forward. So looking at your current and, and future operations and growth, does this location make sense for your internal initiatives? The fourth factor to keep in mind is risk of business disruption. Uh, this is one that not everyone likes to think about, uh, but important, particularly if they're going to be business critical functions in your shared services organization. What level of risk are you willing to accept? Um, now, this business disruption can mean a number of things. Uh, sometimes it means that natural disasters, uh, we've seen floods uh, in the last few years affect uh, some shared services organizations in, in Chennai, for example. Um, but also be aware of um, political or economic disruptions or labor disruption risks. Um, are there things like government shutdowns that, that may impact your organizations? And one thing uh, that you may not have on top of your list, but is actually very important, um, are the legal, regulatory, intellectual property, and data regulations that may impact your operations. The fifth factor um, is again often at the top of people's list, um, but it doesn't necessarily be the most important, and that is cost. Uh, now cost is a, a complex one because organizations, shared services organizations, tend not to choose the most expensive locations in the world, but they're also not in the, the cheapest. What you need is a mix that's really competitive, and um, when you look at the total cost of ownership, provides a competitive advantage. So not only uh, is it cost effective, but keeping all the other factors in mind, if you're gonna be able to recruit the right people, um, all those costs in total, um, keeping that in mind as well. Another thing to look at, uh, is how it will impact your corporate tax structuring objectives. The sixth factor uh, we want to look at is infrastructure. Um, so this means things like electri electrics and telecoms, internet speed, understanding not only the, the speed of that, but what are the associated costs. Um, additionally, um, when we talk about infrastructure, we also mean real estate. Uh, shared services organizations often need large businesses, and if they want to scale up, how much real estate is available uh, and is actually suitable for your purposes. And the final and seventh factor uh, that we want to touch on is precedence. So understanding who else is based there. Some organizations are willing to be pioneers. They're happy to be the first organization in the region, um, and, and take a risk with uh, some, some cities that maybe no one else has really discovered yet. Other companies 
want to see the other organizations similar to themselves have established themselves there. Uh, so understanding uh, are there other shared services centers, headquarters, outsources, or related operations in the region. So we hope this gives you a good overview. Uh, if you're making a short list, uh, what other kind of factors and questions that you should be asking yourself? So with that, I would now like to hand over to Lisa from Sabra. Thank you, Sarah, I appreciate that. Hello, everyone. Um, again, as Sarah said, my name is Lisa Schwab, and, and actually I have what I kind of think of as two different roles here in Montevideo. Um, I am what we call the site leader, so I'm responsible for the overall, over, uh, overall organization. Um, and then I'm also a business leader within the center as well. Um, and before I get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about Sabre. Uh, so Sabre is the leading technology provider to the global travel industry. Um, our technology solutions help airlines, travel agency customers, and hotel customers grow and transform the traveler experience. As you can see from the data on this slide here, um, the amount of transactions that we carry out on a daily basis through our systems puts us at par with companies um, such as Google and Amazon. Um, so as we talk about opportunities um, around the world, I do want to emphasize that we are a global company. Uh, we have uh, 10,000 plus employees. We have presence in 60 companies um, and, and we speak um, 70 plus languages. I think the key thing on this page that I'd like to point out for you guys is that we have presence from, um, from global centers, whether that's a, a service center or a development center around the world. Um, the key three ones I want to point out for you are, of course, Montevideo, which is our largest service center. And then we also have service um, functions in Krakow and, and Bangalore. While those are bigger um, development locations, we do have service there. And then our headquarters, which is in Dallas. Um, I think the, the important thing for, for me when we talk about why Uruguay, uh, so the story begins for us um, back in 2003. Um, and as kind of Sarah mentioned, there were several factors that we were thinking about um, that, that we needed to address. And, and, and in all honesty, um, you know, given 9-11 and some other things for the travel industry, cost, in fact, was an important factor for us. Um, so we looked, at, we looked at kind of two different options, you know, should we outsource or should we offshore? Um, and we did, we did kind of do our due diligence with um, outsourcing. And given what we were trying to, to do, which is, is move service functions, we ultimately believed that um, it was important for us um, to have a, a saber culture weaved into these, into these service functions. So we chose not to outsource. And in fact, what we did is we wanted to, to offshore um, the, the work. So we looked at Colombia and Panama and Costa Rica. We were even beginning to look at Canada. Um, and then we had, a, we had a, one of our customers in Uruguay, as a matter of fact, say to us, you know, hey, why don't you consider coming to Uruguay? There are free trade zones here. There are a lot of things going on. Um, and so uh, we were surprised by that. Um, but we really did. Um, we came and we did some very strong due diligence um, in a very quick period of time. Um, so what did we need? We needed, um, because it was service functions and, and these functions who, who work with our customers every day, we felt like we really did need um, a culture that was, that was more um, service oriented. And while all of Latin America, in my opinion, has a very service oriented culture, certainly U Uruguay does um, from that perspective. So we found that to be a very simple solution for us. Um, and we needed language skills. Um, I would say, let me, uh, you guys may not know this, but, but um, outside of language skills, Uruguay has one of the highest literacy rates in Latin America, which is profoundly interesting to us, right? It was, it really is a, a culture of education. People really do, uh, you know, uh, aspire to be educated uh, and, and go through college and, and the universities and those kind of things. So it was really, really important for us. Um, and besides that education, um, they have a lot of language schools. So what you have is you have people who are going through their normal 
first and kind of second level uh, education, but they're doing it in a, in a different language other than, than Spanish. So for instance, they have German schools and Italian schools and French schools here. Uh, so it was very, very important for us. And, and you know, my opinion, and I've been doing this for 13 years, um, it's very hard not to find somebody in Uruguay, especially in the business world, who is not bilingual and if not trilingual. Um, so a very important um, aspect for us. Um, just for some uh, reference points, here in the center alone, we support 13 languages. So that was obviously very important for us. Um, and we needed sound infrastructure. Um, given the kind of work we were doing with service, um, we really needed to be able to have reliable telecommunications. Um, we found that the utility companies here on TEL were, were you know, moving very swiftly into modern age with their, with their kind of products and tools. Um, and then we found the added benefit of a free trade zone um, and what they were able to provide us is additional infrastructure um, that made things easier for us. Um, so, so the infrastructure was very, very important to us. I think the kind of other two big ones other than security are kind of the political and economic stability. Um, I would say honestly that over, over the last 13 years, we've probably seen a kind of maybe two blips from an economic perspective, but nothing that would that would you know uh, make us want to change um, our actions or to take different to take different steps, um, and certainly um, not as volatile as, as their neighbors such as Argentina and Brazil. So so these are kind of the see, the key things um, that were really important for us and why uh, we chose Uruguay in in the first place. Um, now when we talk about uh, 13 years of success. What does that mean for us? Here's, here's what the story for us. When we first built our business case, we were going to, we were going to move three um, service type functions here um, with a maximum of, of 300 people. I think that initial plan was going to be for three years. Um, I believe what happened for us is, is we hit that 300 um, in, the, in the first two years and everything exploded for us. The talent here was so amazing. The cultural diversity, uh, the, the education, and when I talk about cultural diversity too, and this may sound um, different for you guys, but 98% I think of, of the background here in Uruguay is European. And why that is important um, for somebody like us is because um, Uruguayans, a lot of Uruguayans carry multiple passports. Um, so not only do they have their Uruguayan passport, they'll have an ask for a passport from you know Italy or Germany or France, um, which is important for us given our global our global nature. Um, but what happened was is we it really just exploded, and actually we were growing faster than we than we could. The results um, coming from our customers, who of course initially had had concerns. Um, given the, the time and the presence of what was happening in the industry anyways around outsourcing, um, we just got outstanding feedback from an off, offshoring solution. Um, and what that does is if you go from the initial 300 business case to today where we are, we, we bounce back before, you know, between kind of 980 to 1,000 people because of some seasonality issues, um, is, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty incredible story. So we have two campuses. Um, and we now have four offices. And I think what's important for that is, is that we have um, a lot of different things happening now for us. Um, we have a lot of different job functions. Um, and, and interesting for us is we have kind of our core service functions, which is really important. And we invest a lot of money in that initial education because it's about our core system. But what that does for us is once people have that core foundational knowledge, um, they are really suited to doing other jobs. And so we've done a lot of expansion through the years with that. Um, we, um, and I think what's also important for us is, is after 13 years, we are still competitive within our own company um, for job movement. Um, so, you know, there, there is movement across our organization on a regular basis. Um, I don't think we're going to grow at the speed that we did, let's say, in the first 10 years, 
but we absolutely continue to grow. And again, that is because of the different of the different uh, uh, talent that we see here and the things that are going on um, from from an educational perspective. So what? Uh, uh, let's talk about Saber Montevideo today. Um, so what this indicates to us is that we have um, representation from all of our business units here. Um, I will say that service and support is still foundational to us. Um, I would say it's just a little under 50%, more like 48% um, of the work here. But as you can see, three roles has turned into 180 plus roles and we have over 100 leaders. Um, so we have, we have things like customer training, we have billing functions here, we have collections functions, we have um, over 85 technology positions here, um, we have data analytics roles, um, we now have sales and marketing roles. So we have a lot of different variety here, and what that, what that has done for us is to give us really an opportunity for internal growth within the company so that's kind of professional growth for for our employees personal growth for them um you know going back to passports we have a lot of um we have a lot of customer implementations that we need to participate in having those those kind of diversified uh, backgrounds with passports allows us to easily move people through different countries as we do these implementation um, we as a company encourage our employees um, um, you know, to, to move to different locations, you know, take the experience they have from the center here and share that across um, our different locations. So we do all of those things um, and very, very successful at it. And by the way, our employees consider those types of things as benefits, right? Um, um, Uruguayans love to travel. I don't think that just happens to be the Uruguayans who are in our company because we are a technology company for travel. I think that's a kind of a general statement. Um, so, so they really do value the opportunities that they're able to visit other countries and other cultures um, and to contribute to, to, to the success um, of the company. So it's very, very important for them. And I wanna say too, that we've been able to really grow um, an outstanding leadership model here. Um, we have supervisors and managers, we have directors, we have VPs. Um, so we really do have a diversified leadership team um, as well. And I think the, 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 the aspect of this which has, been which has been interesting for us is as we work with our colleagues in the community, you know, we, we, um, we work with universities in the community. Uh, we were having a problem, for instance, where our, our service is becoming more technical in nature and, and we needed to make sure that our leaders we're keeping up with that type of technology. So we worked with a local university here on a certified program that was five months long. And so we sent our leaders through it. And you know, it was an investment in our part, but a very good opportunity for our employees as well. They've got certification from it. Um, that university is now considering doing that, um, that certification open to the public. So we really do work closely within the community and within the business uh, to, to make sure that we are taking advantage of the opportunities um, that, that the company, or sorry, that the, that the country offers um, um, to help expand the knowledge and the skills of employees as well. So I think, I think that's been really key um, in, in our success here. So the last kind of thought around this is the advantages of having a global center. It has been invaluable to us um, to, to have these centers. Um, sorry, did I say that wrong? Sorry, uh, I know I did that right. So, um, and I think what's important here for us is this. Um, one of the things that I probably didn't explain up front is in 2003, we had a, we had a large center in, in Dallas in the United States where our headquarters is. And then we literally had service centers in every country in Latin America and Europe, um, anywhere from two to 10 people. Um, but we absolutely had no control over education. We didn't have control over the customer experience. Um, we just didn't have any way to scale. Um, it was it was very very difficult for us. And so when you have when you have a global center or global centers, we really do look at things through a global lens, and we are able to drive best practices 
with that type of approach. Um, I mentioned earlier that we had Montevideo, we also have Krakow, we have Bangalore. We are allowed then to utilize the follow the sun model um, from that perspective. But what's really important for us beyond that is honestly, we are able to we are able to to deliver KPIs on how our how our um, employees are being educated, um, how the customer experience is working for us, um, and all of those things. And and because we're the biggest center that does that, we're the ones who are driving the very best practices out there to the other centers. So it's been very important for us um, to really drive to scale, to be able to improve our customer experience. Um, and, and to make sure that we're doing everything we can, not for us only, but for our customers. Um, from a talent pool perspective, um, uh, again, you know, I talked about the fact that, that we encourage people to move back and forth. We really do want to have a diversified uh, a group of people across, um, across our business. Um, so we were able to do that. I think this third bullet is important and it's about retooling. You know, we have to change our model, whether it's a service model or an engagement model or a, or, or a commercial model. Um, and we are absolutely able to retool our employees very quickly to be able to do that because we have, we have good methods of, of getting them educated and repurposed. So it's been very, very important for us. I think the, the problem, you know, we are able to see problems, and identify them, and, and quickly fix them. You know, we literally do talk to our, to our customers every day um, in, in many forms and fashions. And, and because of that, we are able to see things quickly and work to, re to resolve them. And I think, again, why, why Uruguay works for us is we have our headquarters in Dallas, as I mentioned. Um, and then we have we have Krakow and Bangalore, and a lot of our technology that's supported here comes from Krakow. So we are um, at any given time from our headquarters location, we're either two or three hours ahead of them. And then from a Krakow perspective, I think it's somewhere between um, four and five. Um, so what that does is that places us in a position where we are able to talk to sales and we're able to talk to marketing and we're able to talk to developers and we have an overlap during our business hours to make sure that work is being done. So we're not being delayed. So, so Uruguay has positioned us in a very nice place um, to, to be able to do that. Um, I think the other thing that's important for us too is, is that we are providing feedback um, um, to these development and marketing organizations in a very consistent and important way. Um, these organizations rely on us, um, given the fact that we have the closest relationships with our customers, and they are relying on us to deliver that. So I think those, those are important too. I think also the, the company is investing in different ways as well. Last year, we, um, we just, and last year we announced that we would be opening up our commercial sales center here from a, from a headquarters perspective for Latin America and Uruguay. Um, I think, again, what I think that what that does for us is it shows our customers who we've been in business with here in Latin America for over 25 years, our continued commitment to the region by placing our headquarters here. But I think what's also important for us internally is, is that our, our, you know, our own company is giving us the nod that the investment that we made 13 years ago was a solid investment and will continue to do that type of investing in the future. So I think those kinds of things um, are very, very um, important to us and, and delivers. And I think the advantages of having this center and being able to drive the things I've been talking about through the center and making sure that everybody gets the information they need, what they need is, is what helps drive that validity um, for, uh, for the company. Um, and then finally, we, we talk a little bit about our mission. And I'll go very quickly through this. Um, we, you know, we are a service organization, um, and we do uh, we do want to impress upon our 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 teammates and our employees here that that we are a support organization and that we do transform. Uh, we help with transformation and we help with service delivery and execution. We drive these kinds of these kinds of factors into to the conversations that we have every day with employees. We're a very values uh, value driven company, um, and it's very fundamental for us 
to make sure that our employees understand that they are delivering and contributing to the success of our company and to our customers. Um, and then finally, uh, I think this, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our, our partners uh, from a technology perspective. Uh, they, um, they, you know, we have, we have Genesis, um, um, which is a contact, uh, you know, contact tool for us. It moves our contacts around the center um, and in three different channels. We have Aspect, which is kind of a, uh, you know, a human resource uh, scheduling um, uh, technology. We have SAP, Cisco, I'm sure things that you guys are, in, are involved with. Um, and then finally, um, community relations. And I really like to impress upon this. Uh, you know, I talked about, um, I, li I talked about the fact that, that, you know, being able to give uh, people the opportunity to travel um, um, is important um, and it's considered kind of a value proposition from our employees. What I'd like to say is we have a building full of millennials um, and corporate responsibility, while it's core to us, it really is core to millennials. Um, and as we talk about um, our corporate responsibility and how we help our local neighborhoods and our local communities, um, we are told several times by, by prospective hirees that that is something that they value a great deal. Um, so I put that out there to you because given, given the culture, given the generation, corporate responsibility is something that they really do value um, and we see it every day in the discussions that we have with the people that we're hiring. Um, so I think that's the story from me. What I'd like to now do is turn it over to Fiore, Fiore, how we say this wrong, I'm sorry, Fiorella. Okay, uh, thank you, Lisa. It's always a pleasure and we feel really proud that Uruguay to listen to, every time we listen to Saber and Lisa's story in Uruguay. Um, as um, Lisa and Sarah already mentioned, I'm Fiorella Bajundo from Uruguay 21, the Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. And I would like to mention briefly some of the key factors that Uruguay has to offer to companies like Sabre. Uh, as mentioned in Lisa's story about Sabre, uh, there are many advantages in Uruguay for international corporations to set up what we call their regional corporate centers. By this, we mean uh, that companies could uh, and actually do establish their regional distribution centers their headquarters, shared service centers, trading operations, and also IT and R&D activities, or a combination of all of them. So why is this? And actually, I think we, we could figure our value proposition through Lisa's story, but I'm going to mention them briefly as well. First and foremost, because Uruguay offers investment security within an economically attractive region. The country has, has maintained a strong political and social stability for years, uh, supported by a consolidated democracy and the rule of law. Then, because of our talent, and I think Lisa's story has made a really important point uh, um, as depicted in her case, Uruguay offers um, multilingual and very skillful talent, uh, either in English, Portuguese, and in other um, languages, as, as Lisa mentioned. Uh, then, because of our strategic location, in the southern corn. Uruguay, as you know, is, um, or, or maybe you don't, is between the, these neighboring giants, Argentina and Brazil. And um, because of our location and our free trade agreement within the Mercosur and with Mexico from Uruguay, you can have access to a market of approximately 400 million people. Then because of our quality of life, um, also pointed out by Lisa, Uruguay offered a great quality of life for executives and their families, which is very important when you are deciding to move uh, to another country. Thanks to our cultural affinity with Western countries, as, as Lisa mentioned, our stability and tranquility, executives from the US, Europe, and other top regional cities choose Montevideo to live and work. So in terms of reliability, and we really want to make a point here, because we actually stand out from um, the, the, our neighboring countries and the region. Uruguay consistently leads Latin America and the Caribbean ranking in terms of reliability, which is very important for investors. And Sarah also mentioned that. We rank number one in the region in terms of democracy index, low corruption, prosperity, rule of law, 
and in terms of telecom infrastructure and software development. We rank number one in terms of IT development, average internet speeds. In fact, um, we 70%, around 70% of households in Uruguay have access to internet through fiber optics, which is not that common. And we also rank number one, and we have done, we have led this ranking, regional ranking, in terms of quality of life and best place to live according to Mercer. Let me point out something really important here and in terms of reliability. We are constantly trying to make Uruguay an easy place to do business, and that's why um, our business environment and macroeconomic stability has been acknowledged by most credit rating agencies throughout the years. Um, actually, by virtue of our investment law, Uruguay warranties equal treatment for local and foreign investors. There is no need for prior approval or to have any uh, local counterpart or registration to operate in Uruguay. Investors can operate even in their uh, local currency or foreign currency. And there is a single national taxation system. What is more and very relevant for services um, uh, corporations like uh, service operation in Uruguay is that we have a um, um, uh, compliant tax compliance sorry um, tax compliant uh, benefits and uh, fiscal incentives for uh, corporations. Lisa mentioned our free trade zones, which are complemented by uh, free ports, free airports. Within this regime, companies are tax exempt from any current or future tax warranted by the government itself. We have make it an ideal place for uh, operations like Sabre or other companies to use and combine these regimes to use Uruguay as a platform, not only for services, but also for distribution. Then moving on to talent, which is very important for the services industry. Um, Uruguay, Uruguay's talent is highly competitive due to a combination of long-term policies and short-term policies or more specific to the sector. In terms of the long-term education policies, Uruguay has um, high quality of basic technical and university uh, training. I'm sure you have heard this from many countries, but we can actually warrant it through stories like service ones. And uh, something very unique and that we are really proud of which is that we have free public education up until university. Um, we also have, the, the, have been the first country in the world to implement the one laptop per child policy, which was actually um, created by the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it's been operational in Uruguay since 2007. The government with this uh, OLPC program provides laptop computers freely to all students and teachers in high school, and public schools, and 100% of the schools, high schools, and technical universe, universities are connected to internet through fiber optics. Going back to what I mentioned before, households, 76% of households also have internet connection through fiber optics, which is actually um, a proof of how connected and well-developed our telecom infrastructure is. Then, moving on to the short-term and specific policies, for the services industry, uh, we have other programs and platforms such as Smart Talent. Smart Talent started as a job website to, to actually help companies uh, have a skills registry and access to talented people for the industry, but actually has developed into much more. And uh, what the Smart Talent does is to strengthen the connections and the links between three key players in this industry, which is the universities and technical schools, uh, the students and the companies. We are being pioneers in creating these links and uh, making companies to go to the schools, making the, uh, actually the institutions go to the companies and the students in between. So then uh, we also have another uh, important program, which is the Finishing the Schools. Finishing the Schools program is actually grants that the government gives to uh, multinational or local corporations that export services from Uruguay where uh, they can reach up to 70% of the training costs of uh, courses that they uh, have to dictate to their employees, either new employees, potential employees, or current employees. And it's been a, a tool very attractive to the companies 
when they make a decision where to locate themselves and also to grow. Because of all this, um, we enjoy a very successful track record of companies like Saber who have decided to set up their operations and uh, services center in Uruguay. Uh, companies such as BASF, Zingenta, Roche, and Abbott have chosen Uruguay for their shared service centers and trade, uh, regional trade centers, sorry. Then Julius Berg, for example, and UBS provide financial advisory services to their regional clients and here we come up with the strategic location importance uh, from Uruguay. And others like Trafigura, Tenaris, Louis Dreyfus Commodities, and Costco Agri, they have their trading supply chain and FNA support as well. And then moving on to the examples of companies that have their regional distribution centers, Merck, Shimatsu, and SKA are, are some of them. And they also have some back office activities. So wrapping up and before actually finishing, I would like to um, invite everyone to um, the first um, European Investment Forum in Uruguay, which is going to be next, next June 21st and 22nd. I know we don't have a lot of time, but maybe the European audience can be interested and would like to join. And uh, this is actually a proof of how Uruguay is investing a lot into the promotion and putting the country on the map. Um, so those were some of the key factors that make Uruguay a great place to invest, work, and live, as we say. And we look forward to work with anyone who needs further information. We will be delighted to help. Thank you, Sarah. That's great. Thank you very much, Fiorella. And thank you very much, Lisa, for a really insightful presentation on choosing your location. Uh, so again, if you haven't yet submitted your questions to us, you can do so using the, um, the, the question functionality, and that's usually on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so first question, uh, I'm going to put to uh, Lisa, um, and that is, um, it's impressive the, not only the, the growth that you've shown in your shared services organization, but also the diversity of functions. Um, could you just expand a little bit on what was like some of the, the, the first functions that went into shared services in uh, Uruguay and what was the one that really um, proved that the model was successful that, that spurred the growth? Uh, yeah, Sarah, thank you. Uh, so the, the very first functions, we have, we have three different towers. We have um, a travel network, which is our travel agency tower. And we have airline solutions, which is works with airlines, and then we have um, our hospitality, which works with um, hoteliers. Um, so what happened was um, we had three functions uh, that were service and support oriented. So when when our customers are installed and they are utilizing our services and our tools, um, if they have questions, um, they have the ability to call in, email, or chat with somebody. Um, and so those were two of the functions. So that was the, for the travel agency and for our airline customers. We also then moved what we call our support function, which is our back office, which is um, uh, when our customers order our products. Obviously, we have contracts, we have billing, um, and, and those kinds of things. So those were the three, uh, those were the three original functions that we brought in. What happened to us is, um, we knew, you know, we knew about our um, our own kind of KPIs. We knew how quickly it, people learned, what the learning curve was. Um, you know, our training is we we invest a lot of money in our training, and you know, about three months, um, so it's pretty extensive. Um, and so what we were seeing was is we were able to move work faster than we anticipated, and we were actually being pretty aggressive in what we were trying to get accomplished in the first place. Um, so people were picking up things very quickly, um, and they were showing their their you know tenacity of learning and wanting to know more, um, and and asking for you know why does the company do these things and and how do they do it and how can we help? Um, and it literally and those three functions are absolutely core because they're core to understanding our systems. And once you understand our systems, that can take you any place you want to go. Um, and because we were getting such um, tremendous feedback from our own organization um, and from our customers, um, people people who were also looking, looking for scale and things like that absolutely wanted to bring it in. 
Now, I think it was probably in our fifth year or fourth or fifth year when we started bringing in the kind of more softer skills of service and those kinds of things. And we started adding more foundational financial positions and we bring in our technology positions because a lot of our technology positions here are kind of database driven, right? So they're managing databases and 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 um, uh, data centers and those kinds of things. So so just being able to show the speed of which we were able to bring things in and and how our customers were responding to it um, just really energized the organization um, to to bring more more functions into into the organization and into the center. I hope that helps. That's great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, and next question, uh, I'm going to put to uh, Fiorella. Um, this is around uh, the tax incentives. Uh, Fiorella, you mentioned uh, in your presentation um, something along the lines of tax tax reports and some of the tax incentives. Could you expand a little bit on, on what some of the, the tax incentives are for having a business in, in Uruguay? Okay, so as I mentioned, we have a very attractive scheme and tax compliant uh, uh, fiscal incentives, which include the, the fact that we have a free port, um, free airport, and the free trade zones. And in all of the three, companies can establish themselves as long as they export their services, so they are not going to be for the local market, they are fully tax exempt of any current or future tax, let's say corporate tax or VAT or import duties. So uh, the companies can, let's say, if it's a business, purely business services operation, they, they um, and they uh, actually provide services for the foreign market, either any part of the world, uh, they don't have to pay the corporate taxes and uh, the, uh, anything related to the operation in the free trade zone. The requirements for that is that the company has to have 75% of their employees have to be from uh, Uruguay, national, but there are exceptions, especially at the beginning of operations where companies usually need to bring in uh, more uh, foreigners and, and people from other uh, places of the world with more expertise. So that they can apply. Then for the free port and uh, airport, uh, companies, for example, let's say uh, like Merck, what they do is they actually bring in uh, all the biologics from Europe, from Germany, and they actually do here all the, uh, they have the, their delivery center. Uh, they do all the labeling, packaging, and, and the organization of the, the merchandise according to the different markets. And they provide and they do the supply through our airport, the free airport, to all Latin America, from Mexico to Argentina and, and uh, every country. So those are some of like the most important fiscal incentives. Then, very importantly for the industry, the short services industry, we also have um, incent fiscal incentives similar to the ones from the free trade zone. But if they, for example, they are not allowed to establish them, themselves in a free trade zone, to establish themselves outside in Uruguayan territory, um, if they employ more than 100 uh, employees and they plan to grow that into 300 by the third year. So those fiscal incentives are the most attractive ones, but we also have a, an investment law where um, companies can actually. Uh, use the, I mean, uh, discount and get tax credits according to investment made uh, uh, in the country. I'm sure I can, I, I can actually send more information later on, and uh, I hope I have answered the question. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and really, just a follow up to that as well. Um, could you just expand a little bit on what the the free trade zone means? Is it? The, can you compare it to like the European Union, like in terms of freedom of, of movement? Um, I think Lisa also mentioned being able to, to hire from within the zones. So I guess Fiorella first, could you just expand a little bit on what the, the free ch trade zone means? Okay, cool. The free trade zone is actually parts of the city, like campuses, where companies can operate as long as they provide services to other countries. Then we have the free trade agreement, which I mentioned in my, in my presentation, which is like actually similar to European Union, but within uh, with less uh, integration. We are in that earlier stage. 
So we actually, through Mercosur, we have agreements for the free movement of people um, and for trade with Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, um, and then we have associate countries like Chile. Then I also mentioned another free trade agreement, which is with Mexico. And because of that is that we, what we say that from Uruguay, you can reach 400 million people market. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I'm also going to turn this to Lisa as well. Um, how has that kind of free trade zone benefited you? You mentioned it was a, an attractive factor. Um, can you just explain a little bit maybe how you've leveraged it? Sure, sure. Yeah, so the, the free trade zone for us has been has been exceptional um, because as she talked to Fiona talked about, you know, taxes and savings and those kinds of things. Um, so it's been it's been it was quite, you know, we had the incentive to to come from that perspective. But above and beyond, you know, cost and savings, um, these these trade zones um, are super modern in their technology and in their infrastructure. It takes a lot of pressure off the companies that are in the free trade zones um, to do a lot of things on their own. Um, so not only are they are they saving costs from a tax perspective, they are also saving costs and being able to scale easier from a telecommunications and just an infrastructure perspective. So it's been very, very helpful for us and very successful for us. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, another question for you, Lisa. On, um, I mean, keeping keeping people in the shared services. How are you you finding that? Um, a few sub questions in there. I mean, what are your kind of attrition rates like? If and if you can compare those to other um, other regions. Um, and you also mentioned kind of losing, well, not losing, um, but kind of trading talent with the business. Um, and, and do you find that um, that happens a lot? So I guess a few questions in there, but really around the lines of, I mean, how are you finding uh, retaining em employees really in the long run? Yeah, um, actually we have, um, I'm pretty proud of it. We have a, we have a very good um, attrition rate. So we've kind of, we call it a couple of different things. We call it um, um, negative attrition, right? So the, the kind of the undesirable. So the people who are leaving the company because they are finding other positions or moving to other countries, um, runs at about seven percent, which is pretty, which is pretty amazing. Um, um, I would say from a from a shared services center perspective. Um, so we do we do keep um, we do keep our talent, which is good, and that kind of blends into the next question of moving talent around. So when I talk about lateral movement of our talent, or you know, kind of across business units, um, I think what's important for us, and certainly for the employee, for their own professional and personal growth, is is you know, a travel agency type business is very different than an airline business. And but but there are some core skills and some core systems um, that are that, that play across both of those organizations. So, for example, you can come into the, the business on the travel agency side of the business and move very easily to the airline solutions side of the business. And for us, that is really good because we can interchange our people back and forth. Um, and because the businesses aren't exactly the same, you can move them back and forth and they are, they are learning more all the time. Um, and so tremendous amount of career growth opportunity for them, um, which is, which is obviously I think from a shared services perspective, I think it's, it's what people worry about a lot, which they should. Um, and what we've seen is, is that we really do have, um, uh, you know, great opportunity for career growth. Um, and then so we have, so our external attrition is about 7%. Our internal attrition, which is just the internal movement, obviously is much higher. Um, but we have the ability to manage that, right? Um, we have some corporate response, you know, corporate HR um, kind of regulations and things that we can follow. But we also have the same ability to, to, to make exceptions for those. So we're able to move employees as we need to um, internally. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I think that helps us a, a nice perspective, um, and that, that is a very good uh, attrition rate, I would say. Um, also, I've noticed, um, well, just also working with two of you, it seems that there's actually a really nice relationship between you know, Sabra and, and your guy, uh, 21. I'm just wondering what, um, I guess, Fiorella first, I mean, what kind of support are you giving uh, organizations already in there? Uh, and then also, Lisa, if you could just maybe say anecdotally, you know, what kind of support have, have, have they given you? Sure. Okay. So um, as uh, I mentioned, some uh, some of 
topics in the presentation. Um, from Euro Way 21, we help the companies while they are doing, before they make the decision. So we actually provide uh, uh, services for if they have to make a visit and to create an agenda, to meet with the key players, to uh, help when they need to find uh, reliable contacts and everything. Then uh, with uh, information and statistics, we know that the services industry um, has like a, a, a big issue in terms of the statistics and uh, numbers and data relevant and updated. So we work uh, creating and helping to develop the information and getting all the information that the companies need. Um, when the companies are established, we actually provide some aftercare services, which actually um, include and are in our core of the business, which we, from your way 21, what we do is we actually articulate the private sector and the companies and the public sector. Being like a governmental agency, uh, we of course have direct links with the public sector and the ministries that are relevant to the industry. So we are all the time uh, trying to find if there are any issues or problems and developing and helping the legal framework to make it attractive and useful and good for the company. So for instance, I mentioned uh, in the previous question that there is a decree for shared service centers to operate outside the free trade zones and have similar tax incentives as in the free trade zone. So that was something that we actually uh, helped and we were in the core of that development from Euroway 21. We also helped them with uh, the um, talent. Smart talent and finishing the schools are both two tools that Euroway 21 provides to companies to not only find, but also develop talent. Uh, and I think those are some of the key things. Then we are always there in case they need anything. So it's also a, a service on demand, we would say. Yeah, um, and for me, um, kind of the networking aspect, Uruguay being doing all has, uh, sorry, 21 has been um, very good at helping us to connect with other shared services company within the market, um, whether they're in the free trade zone or not. Um, we actually established a shared services club last year, and that was through networking with uh, with Uruguay 21. Um, um, and you know, and so this club is working together to to understand the market and how can we help each other, and you know, what are some of the things that are happening. Um, that we can help to influence and those kind of things. So they've been instrumental in that. Um, as she talked about smart talent, um, you know, we are a technology company, but when you think about the work being done here mostly, um, you know, we for many years were kind of known as a kind of a service company. Um, and as we were trying to expand our technology positions, um, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a challenge for us. So we we worked with the, the folks in Smart Talent. We got our our posting and our postings put up there, um, and really started to kind of turn the corner for us on people understanding um, that we are a technology company that we do have technology opportunities here. So that was very very important. Um, and they have also helped us with some some training funding as well. Um, you know I talked about some of the local local work that we've been doing with universities and some things like that, um, and they have been gracious and offered to assist in some of that fashion as well. So they've been they've been very good good partners with us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so I see that we're approaching the hour. Uh, so I would just like to take a, a last moment to, to thank you, Lisa, again, for sharing your, your really strong story. And thank you, Fiorella, uh, for explaining all the benefits of, of Uruguay and really how you support Lisa and, and, and other organizations as well. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, just a reminder, the slides will be available uh, and everyone on the, the line or who registered will get a link to be able to access them. Um, and again, keep an eye out for the events that we have coming up in the near future, as well as uh, Fiorella's event in uh, Uruguay. Um, we also keep an eye on our webinars and uh, we just like would say thank you again um, for, for everyone participating in this webinar today and we look forward to welcoming you next time. Thank you and goodbye.